Hello from the Center for Livable Cities and a warm welcome to the sixth episode in our CLC webinar series, Cities Adapting to a Disrupted World. I'm your host, Dinesh Naidu, and we are coming to you from a nice sunny and breezy afternoon here in Singapore. We've seen tremendous interest in today's webinar. Over 1,300 people registered for it, and more than half are from 60 countries outside of Singapore. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to viewers around the world. And thank you to our American friends for joining us so late at night. Our distinguished speaker today is Professor Yu Kong Jian, and he will be speaking on the topic, Sponge Cities, Leveraging Nature as Ecological Infrastructure. But first, some housekeeping. To listen to the simultaneous interpretation of this webinar in Mandarin, click on the interpretation tab on your Zoom toolbar and then select Chinese. Following Professor Yu's presentation, I'll moderate a dialogue and audience Q&A with him and our panelist, Professor Thomas Schroepfer. You can pose questions to them using the Q&A tab. If you'd like a copy, our speaker slides can be downloaded from our CLC website now. We are happy to use this occasion to announce the launch of the 17th issue of CLC's flagship magazine, Urban Solutions. This issue was to have been launched at the World City Summit earlier this very month before it got rescheduled to June 2021. The issue theme, Adapting to a Disrupted World, is of course aligned with this WCS edition and our CLC webinar series. Issue 17 examines how cities such as Los Angeles, Jakarta, and Singapore, amongst others, are innovating to weather disruptions ranging from environmental challenges to rapidly aging societies. It features contributions by city leaders and experts like Singapore's senior minister, Teo Chi Hien, resilience expert, Dr. Judith Rodin, Jakarta governor, Anis Basdewan, and economist, Spencer Glendon, amongst others. Regular readers may also enjoy the fresh look of this issue as the magazine has undergone a design revamp. Our speaker today, Professor Yu, also contributed the case study Turning Grey into Green in this issue, which is on a sponge city project in Haiku, China. Professor Yu will speak about this project shortly, but for more details, use the QR code to read all about it in the magazine. Now, I'm very glad to welcome and introduce today's speaker, Professor Yu Kongjian, who is speaking to us from his rural campus near Hangzhou in China. Professor Yu is founder of the College of Architecture and Landscape Architecture in Peking University, as well as his practice, Turinscape. He has won multiple international awards for his work, including 12 Excellence and Honor Awards by the American Society of Landscape Architects, a ULI Global Award for Excellence, and five World Architecture Festival Landscape of the Year Awards. His theory has also been adopted by the Chinese government for nationwide ecological campaigns, and his designs have been implemented in over 200 cities in China and abroad. As an indication of the kind of influence he has, I've just learned from him uh, that a video of his talk on the Bigfoot Revolution has had some 100 million views online, which is pretty mind boggling to me. Uh, Professor Yu was due to speak at our now rescheduled World City Summit, so we are very glad to have him with us today. Without further ado, Professor Yu Kong Jen, the mic is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is my greatest honor to talk with you about Sponge City. Use nature as ecological infrastructure to solve multiple problems or provide ecosystem services. We all have facing such challenges. Climate change is number one, but more than that, we have flood, we have drought, we have pollution, and we have habitat loss. All these problems all these challenges are integrated, are all interconnected. Conventionally, we used to use the solutions we call the gray infrastructure. That is based on industrial technologies, concrete, steel, 
chemicals for building dams, dikes, pumps, pipes, and a very sophisticated sewage treatment system. And we know that this system is necessary in many cases, but they are not resilient. And they by themselves cannot solve the problem. And they are not sustainable. And certainly we need alternative. And this alternative is we call nature-based solution. As opposed, as opposed to the gray infrastructure, this alternative solution is nature-based green infrastructure or ecological infrastructure that can provide better services such as water regulation, life supporting, spiritual and cultural services, and producing food, energy, and clean water. And they can be well integrated into urban landscape, into the city. And the city built upon this ecological infrastructure is nicknamed Sponge City. Believe it or not, building Sponge City has now become a national campaign, a national movement in China. Now here, I just show you how we can make it happen. First of all, make a plan. We need a big picture. Make a must and original plan for this ecological infrastructure. Integrating this hydrological system, a river, tributaries of river, waterways, wetland, lakes, and pond. From the big lake to small lake and all the way to this community garden, make an infrastructure, an ecological infrastructure. And following this master plan, create green sponge based on nature and inspired by the ancient wisdom of farming and water management. Design based on this kind of ancient wisdom, test them and standardize, create a standardized and make replicable modules and then apply to ecological engineering across the scale from community all the way to the regional landscape restoration. And there are so much, so much ancient wisdom we can learn from. Terracing, ponding, diking, islanding. These are all very simple techniques which have been tested and used for thousands of years by peasants and they are working. Now inspired by all these kind of nature-based technique, my term, my team have been practicing for over 20 years and we have built over 500 projects in China and in some part of the world in 200 cities, more than 200 cities. And today I want to just give you two very recent projects the Sponge City campaign in Hainan Island at the very south tip of the mainland China, suffering monsoon climate. The Sanya City, number one project, the usual problem, flood and drought and pollution, habitat loss. So make a big plan, think about how can we handle the storm water? How much space is needed for flood, for urban inundation? And how can we solve, fix the problem as a system, infrastructure? And then create green sponge at the critical spots in the city. This we called eco puncture. Now I borrow the, uh, as a term by Nemo, 
in his recent book, Acupuncture. And this project is called Dong An Wetland, right in the middle of the center of the city. Revival of ancient wisdom, cut and field, create pond and dike system, create a sponge to retain water, to clean the water, and to, to recharge the aquifer. And islands and forests above the water to create a habitat and a public space at the same time. Now here is a rendering and the imagination how this green sponge can look like. It's over one kilometer in size, surrounded by all these residential areas, suffering urban inundation. And it took only one year to come to, look to this picture you can see. Fairly simple, cut and fill, island, forest over the water, terraces, and just a year later, you will have a beautiful urban wetland, man-made park, solve the problem of urban inundation and become public space and birds coming at the same time. This just as this just a result after the project. You can see how this urban area as urban inundation uh, have been uh, 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 as fixed. And there's a property value surrounding this area tripled in just two years, tripled, you can imagine. So if we can fix one spot in the city, we can virtually fix the whole drainage system in the city. Now here's a second project I want to introduce to you is in Haiko, as in another city in Hainan Island called the Mei Sehe River. It's a mother river run through the city. Usual problem of flood, urban inundation, and people have been trying to solve this problem by channelizing the river building concrete wall, dredging the rivers all the time. But for 20 years, never fix it, and even become worse. That was when the project started. Pollution, concrete channels, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and as the riverbank people turn backs on. So turn gray into green. It's soft, vegetated, remove all the concrete. This is how we executed the project. You can see that's the existing situation transformed into green sponge. Remove the concrete from hard to soft and catch the storm water and tears in the landscape. Find the places wherever possible catch the storm water, and even filtrating the, uh, 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 drainage, the drainage and the uh, 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 dirty, dirty runoff, I mean urban runoff from the urban villages. That's the uh, uh, garbage dump along the bank of the river, and it can be improved by sewage, tearing it, and we transform this bank into a water treatment uh, uh, wetland. And this is how it works. It removes all the nutrient. 85% of nitrogen and, uh, and phosphorus can be removed by this terraced wetland, constructed wetland. And it becomes a public space, public open space. Look how people love this place. And here you can see how the concrete wall, so, 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 so hard concrete wall being removed. It was before and during the process of construction. And just after one year, the mangrove come back and it become a welcomed public space. And this concrete material can be recycled to turn into islands. And this island, become habitat for birds, biodiversity, and fish 
also come back. Now remember, this is just in two years difference, just in two years, totally transform the urban landscape. So more than ever, more than ever, we have to rethink the way we build our cities and the way we treated water and the way we live. We need a revolution. I call it a big feet revolution to solve the problem based on nature's big feet, not banded feet, not bounded feet. And certainly we have to think like a king. We need a big picture. Have a big master planning for the, the city, for the region, and for the nation. But we have to able to act like a person. Now, a person now how to deal with water, how to deal with land, with earth. Use a fairly simple technique like cut and fill, terracing, ponding, diking, and islanding. We can virtually solve the problem, transforming the global landscape. If, but if we are not the king, we have to convince the king how to transform the landscape. Now that's why one of my first book is a letter to leaders of China. Talk to leaders, the mayors, governors, the presidents. And uh, this, is, this is a new version of my uh, uh, 2003 book called Talk to Mayors. It was edited by Professor Michael Sorkin. Uh, he, I'm sorry, he passed away during this COVID-19 attack in New York. And we have to act like a peasant to design the ecologies of the natural system and recover the degraded urban nature. Thank you. That's what I want to share with you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Professor Yu, for showing us how we can marry ancient wisdom with modern urban planning to make our cities more resilient and indeed beautiful. Uh, equally inspiring are your remarkable achievements in changing minds at the highest levels. I like your advice to think like a king but act like peasants. This is Thank a good you. time to reveal the results of our poll question. And we asked you in the waiting room, how can nature-based solutions help cities enhance livability and mitigate the effects of disruption such as climate change? So I can see that uh, many of you, 90% said uh, reduce urban heat island effect. That seems to be the number one uh, benefit that you see. Um, but people seem to have uh, sort of mixed views and not, not such strong views about the impact uh, of such solutions on property values and social ties. Um, so that's interesting. And I think we will go into that a little bit during the dialogue now. Uh, let me welcome our panelists for the moderator dialogue and audience Q&A, Professor, Thomas, Professor Dr. Thomas Schropfer. He is the founding associate head of pillar of architecture and sustainable design at SUTD, the Singapore University of Technology and Design. He is also a member of the steering committee and core research team of the Singapore ETH Center Future Cities Lab. He has published multiple books, which have been translated into several languages, including Dense and Green, Innovative Building Types for Sustainable Urban Architecture. He has received several prestigious awards and recognitions, including the President's Design Award, which is Singapore's highest honor accorded to designers and designs across all disciplines. Professor Schropfer's second book uh, in his Dense and Green Cities, Architecture as Urban Ecosystem, was published earlier this year. It explores the interaction between buildings and the city as ecological systems, which brings me to my first question to him. Uh, how can buildings and the city interact as an ecological system? And why is this important? Professor Schopfer? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. Um, and a warm welcome also from uh, my side. And of course, a big thank you to Professor Yu for your wonderful uh, presentation. 
Uh, as for the question regarding the interaction of buildings and the city as ecological systems, which is the topic of the book that is shown on the slide here, we see in Singapore and many other places around the world an increasing number of urban design and architectural projects that explore the integration of green spaces in large buildings. This often results in interesting new building types for high density urban environments that include public spaces, extensive screen, sky terraces, sky bridges, vertical parks, roof gardens and other green components on elevated levels. So very often combinations of all of these uh, apply to mixes of residential, civic and commercial programs conjoined at times to produce vertical cities in which the building section becomes what the horizontal plane has entailed up to now. So what's interesting is that density and sustainability in these projects are not contradictory, but rather mutually dependent and synergistic. So the book features various aspects of dense and green buildings and cities that we have studied at the Singapore ETH Center Future Cities Laboratory uh, over the past five years, and they include architectural, environmental, social, and economic benefits that such buildings provide. On the second slide, um, you see a typical spread from the book. This is actually from one of the case studies, one of the 19 in total case studies that we cover uh, in this publication. Uh, it shows you Boha's or Asia Hotel downtown, which is a mixed use development in Singapore's central business district that was completed in 2016. The project is interesting in that it features large sky gardens on multiple levels and a spectacular green facade. What you see in the drawings on the right are mappings of the surface temperatures. So buildings like Oasia can for example, help to mitigate urban heat island effects. And that, of course, is uh, already in response to one of the outcomes of the poll that CLC uh, ran at the beginning of this um, event. On the last slide that I'm going to share with you, uh, this shows um, a recent exhibition that we had at the National Design Center Singapore where we showcased some of the results of our research at the Future Cities Laboratory. Unfortunately, the exhibition has just closed, but uh, it'll travel to Venice, Italy, uh, where it will be shown from the end of August to uh, February next year. And with that, I would like to hand the mic back to uh, Dinesh. Thank you, Thomas. All right, let's now get straight to some of the interesting questions from our audience. Uh, we've received quite a few questions, both uh, earlier in advance and now live. The first question uh, I'd like to pose seems to be directed at Professor Yu and is from Fi Ho in Ho Chi Minh City, who asks, how can we get, how can we start the retrofitting of sponge cities? Professor Yu, what advice would you give on how cities can get started on this journey? Well, this is a, this is a right question. Uh, Ho Chi Minh City, I will say uh, all the, the monsoon climate uh, cities uh, were suffering, you know, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, India, uh, Bangladesh. We, we have the same problem, the monsoon climate. So as sponge city compared to the pipe system uh, will have much, much resiliency. Uh, so to start with the project, first of all, to, to change the mindset, to change the idea, to change the concept. We're always depending on the industrial uh, technology. We think the pipes, the pumps can fix the, the city. But we forget that the industrial revolution come from Europe. And we follow the city building model. So follow the European model or American model. And this, that doesn't fit the monsoon climate. You know, that's what we, what I found. And most of the monsoon climate actually are, are within the, the developing sphere. I mean, the developing, developing world. So we have to have a new model, a new way of infrastructure to adapt to the monsoon climate. So that's one way, that's the first part. I think that to change the mindset. 
the mentality from the, the, the leadership to academia to the technocratic system, the code system even, we have to change it. Uh, to turn back, to reclaim, to recover the ancient wisdom which, which, which come from adaptation to the climate. So that's my uh, uh, first advice. The second, of, of course, we need a master plan, a regional plan across a scale from the regional thinking, where to locate our new city. Like Vietnam, like China, we have another 50% uh, population have to go into city. So where is the next city? Now that's important. To build a city on the highland, which will never can be, which can never be flooded. Uh, and secondly, build a sponge system within the city to live with water, to adapt to the water, to adapt to the flood. Now this can be as small as a threshold. To raise the threshold, threshold to become a water lock. Now that's only very subtle change. So from regional thinking, a master plan to, to just adjust the building to adapt to the flood. Now that what I have learned from uh, my practice in the past 20 years. All right, thank you. Uh, changing mindsets and planning. Um, this connects well to our next question, and uh, I would like to pose this question to Professor Schroep for this time. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Mayor Daryl Dexter Wee of Dipolog City in the Philippines, who is also one of our WCS Young Leaders. And he asks, how can cities integrate nature-based solutions in urban planning? Uh, Professor Schroepfer. Yeah, thank you, Dinesh, and thanks for the excellent question. This, of course, is a, is a very big one, right, and not easy to answer, but, but let me give this a shot, uh, taking Singapore as an example. Uh, in Singapore, since the early 2000s, um, the city has pursued a number of research studies and demonstration projects that have explored the integration of green spaces in buildings. So these projects, they have led to a number of uh, policies and initiatives, uh, such as the GFA exemption for communal sky terraces, landscape for urban spaces and high rises, just to, to name a few. Huh? So these policies and initiatives, they have been instrumental for the subsequent experimentation with dense and green buildings in the context of this city. Uh, in addition, uh, Singapore has recognized that the combination of buildings with larger urban green spaces, such as green corridors, parks, nature areas, and nature reserves can form a very good interconnected matrix that can become part of larger ecosystems. So in summary, the recognition that nature-based solutions can help to improve the urban environment as a whole has helped in the context of Singapore to steer what we in our research refer to as the dense and green agenda towards an integrated and tacit element of planning and design in that again, density and livability are not seen as contradictory, but rather as mutually dependent and synergistic. Okay, fantastic. And that uh, connects uh, wonderfully uh, to our next question, and this was not scripted, uh, uh, which I would like to pose to Professor Yu this time. Uh, and it's a question from Kushbu in Delhi, which I thought was very interesting. How do we deal with extremely dense urban fabrics with limited open space? And, and we've received a few questions now during the live uh, audience Q&A as well along these lines. Professor Yu, uh, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I think this should be given to, to Tom's, but, uh, but uh, certainly <laughs> at my back, look at my back, so it's, uh, it's a living wall. Now this living wall is part of a water collection system, a storm water recycling system. I collect storm water from the roof and the recycle through the green wall and I have a storm, a, a water this, uh, a tank, storage tank near in this, uh, uh, underneath and here. Uh, so if in the very dense city, in the center of the city, you, if everyone, if every family, if every community can collect stone water, store it, recycle it, reuse it, we can solve the problem. Because as, as you see, like in monsoon 
climate area. Uh, usually maximum you have like 2000 millimeter of rainfall, annual, annual rainfall something. So uh, by calculation, you can basically, theoretically, if every family can collect stormwater, we can solve the monsoon uh, climate. And, and the cycle, you know, dry, during the dry season, it's drought. During the wet season, we have this flood problem. Okay. Sponges, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Um, Professor Schopfer, do you have anything to add uh, as, the, as the expert on this topic? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. Um, I, I would again point to the research that, that we have done over the last couple of years. So I think it's clearly, uh, it, it, it has been shown that vertical greenery, uh, public and common sky terraces, again, roof gardens, green roofs, those elements can be very important types of urban greenery alongside more traditional parks and green corridors. So it's, it's very clear to me that planners and designers should therefore apply what we also call biophilic design and include features such as green roofs and you know the whole list that I mentioned earlier as an integral part of buildings wherever possible. And I think that brings us closer to uh, you know, a, a very good integration of green blue systems and the built environment. And, and I think your book is a very good uh, resource of inspiration and examples in, from around the world as well. Okay, um, now we have a good question that is related to the climate crisis. Um, and it is from Ani Adela in Surabaya. I'll ask Professor Yu to answer this one. How can ecological infrastructure help cities that face extreme rain and floods, and, and I always like to, to just mention that uh, we have received several other questions uh, along these lines as well. So, uh, Professor Yu. Yes, so that's exactly I have uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, we try to solve the extreme climate, the flood, in particular the flood, huge flood. Now also happening in Europe, in, in London, you, in Paris, you can see they're also suffering the flood. Uh, conventionally, I mean, uh, traditionally, uh, the, the rainfall in Europe, in European countries are very, very uh, uh, mild. Uh, now also have a similar monsoon type of climate, you know, it's a heavy pour uh, during very short period of time. And all the pipe system doesn't work because they are not resilient. The pumps doesn't work. The pumps cannot fit this kind of heavy rain. And, and nature-based solution may be the only way, the only way. The ecological infrastructure is the only way because it's nature-based. It's based on water, natural water system, it's a wetland, it's lake and uh, the water channels and parks and green systems. So this, this is only resilient. Nature is resilient, it's resilient. So I, I, I will say that if you have a plan, leave, give, like it's 20 to 30 percent of open of urban urban land to the green sponge, the ecological infrastructure, you will basically solve the problem. Uh, certainly, you need a, a better design. You need a design, a, a, a biosoil system, a wetland, a filtrating system, of course. Uh, but that's certainly uh, a more resilient, uh, more resilient. Now that, that's that's uh, how ecological infrastructure can do. Okay, great. I, I think uh, many people are very um, fascinated uh, and, and, and they find these projects very beautiful and very appealing, but they wonder, you know, uh, can it really solve some of these problems? So that was one question. And now another common question we're receiving, uh, if I can ask the team to flash it, is related to maintenance and durability of such ecological infrastructure. Uh, so one of our audiences today is asking about this. And I would like uh, to get uh, both of your quick thoughts on this question, maybe starting this time with uh, Professor, Professor Schropfer. Uh, certainly, uh, Dinesh. So uh, we have also, as, as part of our research, we have looked into exactly that question because we find very often when we show the projects that we study, we get similar reaction. Oh, it's all very beautiful, but must be very expensive and hard to maintain. 
However, uh, the, the projects that we studied, which include many projects in Singapore, but also a couple of control cases in other parts of the world, uh, we actually conducted cost benefit analysis uh, to assess and compare buildings with integrated green spaces in terms of the economic impact. And actually what we found is that the economic benefit typically outweighs additional construction and maintenance costs. So to translate this, uh, yes, it is more expensive to build a dense and green building. Yes, there are maintenance costs. But the gain, the economic gain that you achieve through having a building like this is usually bigger than what you put in uh, in terms of money. Mm. So when you have a dense and green building, typically the rents are higher. I think Professor Yu gave a great example with uh, one of the projects that he showed today where he uh, mentioned that real estate prices have um, tripled, if I remember correctly, around this. So I think this is an effect that we see very often uh, tenants are typically willing to pay more to be in a nice green, blue environment. And I think that should not be forgotten uh, in the equation. So for the Singapore case, we found that maintenance is typically somewhere in the range of 3 to 5% of total maintenance costs for such buildings. Uh, that, of course, varies in other parts of the world, but this is what we found in Singapore. And definitely in Singapore, it makes a lot of sense to build uh, a dense and green building if you're interested in it uh, as a kind of uh, value proposition. Mm. Okay, Professor Yu, do you have something to add? Well, here is, uh, uh, certainly I totally agree with Thomas, uh, but uh, certainly we have to understand that the nature based is based on nature. So it's based on natural system. The economy and the ecology, actually one word, they are the same thing, the nature, Nature's economy, nature's e ecology. So nature's economy is ecology, okay? So uh, the ecology means you cost less, you have no waste, you waste value, you, you have no waste. So like the wall at my back, you, you have seen many artificial walls which in, in the airport or whatever. Now those are artificial, are totally cosmetic, ornamental in some case. Yeah. Now those kind of green, it's not ecology, it's not ecological infrastructure. So ecology must really be based on natural system, uh, safe energy, safe material, recycling water. Uh, uh, so that, that's, we have, to, we have to make a distinction between fake ecology and uh, deep ecology, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we are talking about deep ecology. We, uh, we are talking about deep forms. So if, if, if we consider that, a deep form of ecology is really economical, right? You, uh, based on our project, you will have, you will cost only a, a quarter of normal park to build a sponge park, for example. If you build a wall, which is a sustainable wall, like green wall like that, you'll find a very little maintenance, like this wall, very little maintenance, only a pond recycles water. So that's why, uh, it's really easy to maintain, but you have to understand that. You have to understand the ecology, to follow the ecology, adapt to the natural process. Mm. Okay, yeah. well said, thank you. Um, I think we have time to squeeze in another, maybe one question. Uh, and this one is about conservation. Uh, one of our audience members has asked this. Um, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot a bit, Professor Yu Kong-Jen, and ask you, were original grasslands conserved uh, when the new green infrastructure was built? Um, to what extent uh, are you able to, to retain some of these original uh, landscapes, uh, if any, in the first place? Uh, well, so original grassland, I... I so you must be in some part of the world which is semi-arid or whatever. I mean, so <laughs> uh, certainly we preserve as much as possible whatever, whatever kind of natural habitat. For example, the mangrove, you have to preserve the mangrove. Forest, you should preserve forest. So ecology is based on fitting and fitness. So whatever can grow here, you, you, you should preserve it. But that doesn't necessarily beautiful. Hmm. Ecology not doesn't beautiful in some case. It can be messy. 
So that's why we need, we need a new way, a new language of designing an ecological system so that it can be also beautiful. So that I call a deep, deep form, a deep form. Underneath is the ecological process. We follow the ecological process, but at the same time, it becomes beautiful for human beings to use and to, to enjoy. Uh, so that's, it's a challenging for a new, a new professional skill, I would say. Huh? Okay, yeah. And it takes a lot of uh, artistic sensitivity as well. It's a cultural landscape and you've connected it to uh, deep traditions like the rice fields. I think uh, the Haiku project is very poetic and elegant. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen. I think we have uh, run out of time for audience questions, um, but I just want to thank uh, both uh, Professor Yu Kong Jen and Thomas Schropfer for sharing your work and your time with us today. It was really inspiring. And I think uh, we can see that from rivers to buildings, the scope for nature to help cities become more livable and resilient and beautiful is very significant and multifaceted. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Dinesh. I thank you. Thank for... you very much, Dinesh. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm. All right. Our next webinar will be in two weeks on the 13th of August. It is titled Rebuilding the Construction Industry, the Russian View. Our distinguished speaker is Deputy Minister Nikita Stasishin of the Russian Federation's Ministry of Construction Industry, Housing and the Utilities Sector. He will assess the future of Russia's construction industry, especially in light of COVID-19, and how the sector is adapting to challenges such as safe distancing, affordability, and housing provision. Please register to attend using the QR code or the link. This webinar has been live streamed on CLC's Facebook page and we'll upload a recording of it in the next hour or so on our CLC YouTube channel, where you can find over 500 other videos, including several related to the topic of building with nature, which is the topic that CLC is very interested in. Finally, thank you to you, dear viewers, for your participation. We hope you find these webinars useful. Before you leave, please use the QR code or link to fill in our feedback form. Do tell us what works and, of course, how we can do better. We've come to the end of today's webinar, but we will be leaving this room open for another 10 minutes. Feel free to exchange comments with each other using the chat box function, which is now enabled. Until our next webinar on the 13th of August, goodbye and stay healthy.